From the studios of KENW on the campus of Eastern New Mexico University, it's You Should Know, featuring the people and events of Eastern New Mexico and West Texas. Welcome to You Should Know. I'm your host, Evelyn Ledbetter, and I have the pleasure of having former Senator Stuart Engel here with us. I guess that should actually be retired. You're not former, so well, retired I senator. Am, I am retired and former both, <laughs> so we're, you are right on both, both parts. Uh, we've known each other a couple of days. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure. I'm glad I had the chance to, to get you scheduled and come in. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, always thank you. has been. You've always been such a huge supporter of Eastern and done so much for the school and the station and um, you were looking at some of the equipment, and I know a lot of what's here has to do with your help when you were in Santa Fe. Well, this so. was an easy thing to do because this is the best public television station in the state. We're going to quote you on that. Well, you're welcome <laughs> to do that because it's, it's, uh, everybody, everybody agrees with that. We, we have a stellar program, and lots of people have their hands in it. So. Well, it works. It does. It does. Well, let's talk about you a little bit, a little of your history. Tell me where you grew up and your parents' background a little bit. And well, I was uh, uh, born in Clovis uh, in uh, 1947, just barely, December 27th. And uh, Portales didn't have a hospital here. And my folks lived in Clovis. My father was a uh, broom corn buyer. There was a crop that was grown here that they make natural corn brooms out of and grew a lot of it in the Portales, Tucumcari area. I've and pulled broom corn. Well, I was a little bitty. There was not much fun to doing no. that. And it's always been a hand harvested crop. And it's, and it's all grown in Mexico now <laughs> because of that. But, but, your, but your dad was the one that had a, he was the where, had a warehouse or he something? He had warehouses that? down here, uh, just a, not far from here at all on the railroad. We shipped by rail and cars and shipped all over the United States. And uh, his dad and his five brothers had started the company in the 20s because they had a livery stable in Oklahoma, Shattuck, Oklahoma, when they grew a lot of broom corn there. And people that had broom factories came there and bought broom corn from the farmers. And they were from back east, and it was a lot of trouble for them to come out. So they got acquainted with my grandpa and his brothers, and they started buying it for them and uh, became a business that was— uh, we had offices in Los Angeles and Philadelphia and Kansas City. Wow. Springfield, Colorado, Portales, uh, bought broom corn in Beeville, Texas, and then ended up, the business ended up south of Monterey at Torreon, Mexico. And uh, broom corn was uh, always harvested by hand labor. Right. And in the, by the time the mid-70s came, that kind of labor was just plain not available. You can't get it. I know there yeah. used to be crews that came in and and would mm -hmm. help with the harvest and pick it up after it was on sleds and things like that. Right, and it's uh, it's one of those things that was a it was a wonderful occupation for those my grandpa and his five brothers and my dad and uh, we had some other folks uh, that ran offices in Tucumcari and Springfield and Kansas City and Philadelphia and it's uh, we had. Uh, it, it was quite an interesting business is what it was. <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, so few people actually realized that it was a crop that right. was actually grown. And you've always just seen brooms and you never did really know Didn't where give, broom corn came from. Well, and you hardly see any of them made with that now. It's all plastic and synthetic. There's a lot of it, but they, the natural part of it, and the, of course the, in the country, lots of things have gone back to talking about organic and natural things. And a broom corn broom still sweeps better than a plastic <laughs> broom. And, and so, sir, you grew, you graduated from Clovis siblings? No, no I graduated. Did? My folks moved down to Portales oh, okay. in the fifth, early 50s and uh, uh, had a house on Main Street, 9th and Main, that my father bought from an old contractor. I don't remember his name, but the house was built in 1936. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a really, really a neat home, still is. And... Uh, uh, that's where I grew up and uh, went to, went to uh, well, it was great. The grade school was called East Ward then. It's called Steiner now, mm -hmm. but it was called East. There was three, three grade schools here when I was a little boy, East Ward, Central, and Lindsay. And uh, now we have, you know, another one besides that. And it's, our school system's grown here and done very well. It has. Really, really a good school system here. And, and uh, I was... Uh, 
went to went through high school here. I was never much in athletics. I enjoyed lots of things, of, as in lots of drama stuff, plays uh -huh. and things like that. Enjoyed doing that. I would have not guessed that. Well, it's uh, I was the youngest one in my class, the Ma last one to get a driver's license because my mother wanted to get, start me in school and get me out of the house. <laughs> so I started when I was five and I wasn't uh -huh. six until the first of the year. So. <laughs> well, and, and I think you've told a story that uh, you started out, your dad kind of gave you an edge and you, you wound up... Um, going to school at Nimi for a while. Well, I didn't wind up there. I was sent there. <laughs> I was being polite. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, my, I remember when I got out of high school, I uh, was in the summer and my dad, we were sitting around the table somewhere, I guess. And he said, uh, where do you want to go to college? And I said, well, I guess I'll go here at Eastern. He said, no, you're going to go to the Institute. And I said, <laughs> where is that? And he said, it's Roswell. I said, that's that's a military school. I don't want to go there. He that, said, too bad. We're, we're going to get you some structure. <laughs> we're going to get you some. He, as I remember what he said, he said, you need to learn study habits. I'm going to guess there said, may be some history that led up to this. There's lots <laughs> of history there. My sister did not was a great student in high school. didn't do well in college. And I found out later that my father had actually uh, flunked out of college. Himself, but, so uh, he was not going to let that happen he with was, you. I was the only fa person in our family that ever got a college degree. Well, and congratulations. I have 162 hours with a bachelor's. <laughs> I wanted to have a well-rounded education. That's true. I think that's a few hours over what you have to yeah, have. I only had 120, but I wanted to be, uh, I even took French because I was, was going to be sent to Vietnam. I knew I'd be drafted. And uh, they said, if you don't know French, you really get along a lot better in Vietnam. Of course, you don't learn French in a couple of, in one no, semester. No. But uh, anyway, it's uh, it's an interesting story. And the Institute was a good place for me to, to probably start college. And then I uh, went to uh, Oklahoma State mm -hmm. in Stillwater. I wanted to go to school. And he said, no, he said, I don't want you to go to school in New Mexico. He said, you need to go somewhere else. Mature a little bit and live and on your own. And I had some cousins that were in Stillwater and I didn't have a car. So he took me over there and uh, then uh, they would, we'd meet about halfway. They'd bring me about halfway back to Portales. And okay. It's, uh, but eventually I'm, uh, you know, finally got an automobile so I could drive back and forth myself. It certainly was nice. But, <laughs> well, uh, and uh, then you came back and farmed and ranched? I did. I came back and began to, uh, my father had uh, some cows and uh, we had some farmland and then bought some more. And uh, I started in, uh, you know, in the early 70s right. and uh, a bit uh, you know, it's it's agriculture is a is a great industry, and I liked it, and I enjoyed you know raising cattle, and I enjoyed. It's lots of times farming is is pretty boring, and then when you depend on rain, sometimes it gets a little bit nerve wracking, and it, uh, it's a lot of gambling for it sure. Is, it's gambling. People it say, is. "Oh, you you believe in gambling?" I said, "Well, I was a dry land farmer. I gambled I gambled on rain every year, you and did. I planted seed in dry ground, hoping it would rain. So, if you want to gamble, that's a gamble. That's true. And, uh, you know, it's a it's a wonderful occupation. There's a lot of luck involved, and then uh, sometimes it's it's there's really ninety percent luck and ten percent skill. I think so. The and, weather and what it does uh -oh. to you. It's it's so many things out of your hand. And uh, in the hands of the good Lord, and hopefully, sometimes it's uh, the blessings are good, and sometimes they're a little short. You might should if you make one something one year, you better put it in your pocket and spread it out for the next ten. You better get ready because <laughs> it won't be that way no. years in a row. That's for sure. So, how did you how did this lead you into politics? What, was that something you were ever had that inside of you that you, you know, were interested I was, in? Uh, I was uh, on when. Barry Goldwater ran against Lyndon Johnson in the uh, 64 election. I debated for Goldwater on the, on the, in the gymnasium at Portales High School. We had a debate between myself and a young man named Wesley Patterson. And uh, he debated for Lyndon Johnson. I debated for Goldwater. And... Uh, it was so interesting because the student body voted in the presidential election 
And what was so interesting is the percentage of votes for both candidates matched what it was in the United States. That's crazy. So it reflected the views of their reflected parents. Reflected the view of the parents. Right. And, and, and how, you know, the, I always thought I won the debate, but the election I lost. Huh. And uh, because Goldwater got beat by about the same percentage mm-hmm. that Lyndon Johnson beat him in 64, which was pretty huge. And, uh, you know, I was in, co- in high school when Kennedy was assassinated mm-hmm. in Dallas. I remember that it's, it's, something came over the loudspeaker during the middle of class, right. which just didn't happen. I mean, you you had announcements maybe at, in the morning or maybe at right after lunch or something that came from the principal's office. But this was all of a sudden something just blurted out. And, you know, we weren't really listening. And then it was repeated again. And I remember that day the classwork just completely stopped. Right. Everybody, the whole country just stopped. The whole country stopped. Mm. And we came back after lunch, but we never did go back to class. We just were there and talked about it. And then final announcement said, okay, everybody just go home. You know, I think that's a day most people do remember. Because it was such a, you know, we just hadn't had anything right. like that happen. Right. And uh, uh, it was, a, of course, back then, television, you know, had coverage on it and things like mm-hmm. that. And, uh, of course, the rumors were just all flying all over the place about sure. who did what and how many shots were fired and who was this and who was that. And then, you know, they caught this guy and uh, then... Uh, you know, they were taking him a couple of days later to another place, right. and he got shot. And uh, Was it Mickey Barnett that got you started mm-hmm. into politics? Mickey what? Barnett was an attorney here in Portales right. that had won that seat in 1980, and he was moving to Albuquerque. I don't remember where I was, but outside of a store somewhere, and he was coming out, and uh, he said, He'd done a little bit of legal work for me or something, right. and uh, nothing major, some deed work or something. But anyway, he said, can you come by my office in a few days? And he said, need to visit with you about something. And uh, so I said, yeah, I'll get by there. And I don't know, three or four days, I called and said, well, he wanted to visit with me. And the girl, the, it was his secretary, said, well, come on in about right now or Two hours, whatever. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, I get in there with him, and he said, uh, I want you to run for my Senate seat. And I said, well, well, Mickey, what are you? What's, he said, well, I'm moving to Albuquerque. And he said, uh, I want you to run for it. And he said, you don't have to tell me now. Just think about it. And, of course, I didn't realize, and, you know, I'd never been in politics to amount to anything at all, but I didn't realize that there's lots of little things go with that. And all of a sudden, I get a call from uh, Pete Domenici, who had just been elected to the Senate. And uh, he called me and he said, hey, Stuart, this is Pete. And I said, <laughs> okay. I didn't realize it was Pete Domenici. And he, he started talking, and I said, is this Pete Domenici? And he said, Yeah. Who did you think it was? And I said, well, I don't know. I was just playing said, along, hoping and, I figured uh, it out. And anyway, he said, uh, I understand we want uh, you're going to run for Mickey's seat. And I said, well, I haven't really decided that. And he said, well, you need to do that. And he said, I'll help you, whatever you need. I'm running again this year and whatever. And I said, well, oh, I'll think about it. He said, good, you think about it. He said, there's schools you can go to and things. He said, it's not something you just have to do by yourself. There'll be lots of help. And oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, Joe Skeen then called me and two or three other people from, and uh, that were serving in Washington from Texas. And, uh, you know, pretty soon you get to thinking, golly, I'm really something. That's they some really pretty hard hitters that were calling you Pete and, and Joe I didn't really realize that uh, I, there were so few Republicans registered mm-hmm. back then. I went to this uh, workshop, and they were talking about how many signatures you needed and how to get signatures right. in your petitions and how they had to be done correctly or they didn't count. And so I came back home here and uh, my district had three counties in it. It was District 31 then had Chavez, Roosevelt, and Curry. And uh, I thought, well, I'll see how many signatures I need. 
I didn't realize that half of Portales was in a Senate district from a senator from Lovington named Bill McKibben. Isn't that crazy how our districts are all chopped up? Well, I just thought it was all Roosevelt County. I mean, I didn't know anything about that yeah. stuff. Anyway, found out uh, my folks had moved from a house that, uh, that uh, I, the house I grew up in, and I moved into their house. That house was in my Senate district, but where they moved wasn't. Isn't that odd? My folks couldn't even vote for me. But anyway, make a long story short, I just needed 18 signatures to run. Oh. And I thought, wow. I can do that. That's not very many. And, uh, of course, there weren't very many Republicans here either. But <laughs> that's there, true. There was quite a few in Roswell, and I had some help down there. So it wasn't too hard to get that, that's for sure. But uh, anyway, I uh, ran against a, a, a fellow that worked out here for Eastern named Roger Hardaway. He, ran mm -hmm. as, he had run against Gary Robbins the election before for a House seat. And this was 1983? I was, I was running in the fall in, in 84. Okay. And my first year I was sworn in was 85. Okay. But uh, he had run in 83 against Gary Robbins and, uh, at a house seat, and Gary had beaten him. And then he ran against me in that seat, and I was fortunate enough to beat him then. And then, uh, But he worked for Eastern. Mm -hmm. He was East one of, I think he was kind of an attorney for Eastern. That had to be an eye-opening experience the first time you got to Santa Fe. Oh, my God. I'd never even been in the Capitol. Right. And it was amazing because everybody up there knew my name. <laughs> They'd been talking about this guy from Portales yeah, that's about well, to show up. You know, it's their job to know your name up there. And it's, mm -hmm. they, they're, very, they're real good at it. And they're great people up there in that capital. They really are. And you always hear about all these people in government that are this or that. And that's not true. It's like every other occupation in the whole world. There's great people in it. And there's people that are not as great as others. Right. And it's right. just the way it is. Well, and somebody, there was a rumor that you showed up at your first session and didn't even have a pencil or a piece of paper. I went to a first. I went <laughs> to the first interview I had, and that was not a rumor. It was the <laughs> Roswell paper. Chamber of Commerce had a meeting of all the candidates that won, mm -hmm. and I walked in that building down there in Roswell. I don't remember where it was, but I was a little bit late, which is normal for Stuart Engel. <laughs> and uh, Tim Jennings who had been elected as a Democrat down there. He'd been elected another a term already. And I, was, I, had, I sat next to him, and uh, I noticed everybody had paper and pens and things like that. And I looked over at him, and <laughs> he had kind of a legal tablet. And, and I said, uh, can I borrow a piece of paper from you? And he said, you didn't bring anything? And I said, no. He said, okay. <laughs> he gave me a a couple of pieces of his legal pad, and he said, I guess you need a pen too, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, I got one. <laughs> did, did he, he tease you and say, bring your big chief tablet he, and your big crayons next time? That's pretty much what he said. he said. He said, you know, you need to have something when you come to these meetings to write something down. Oh. That way it looks like you're listening. <laughs> At least just fake it, even if yeah. you're scribbling. But anyway, it was he and I became good friends and stayed friendship for all the years we were in there, we worked together. He was a Senate pro tem for many years, and I was the Republican floor leader for many years. And, uh, you know, we we worked together on things and certainly didn't always vote alike, but we, we maintained a good friendship and, and, you know, hopefully did a few decent things for the state. I'm pretty sure you did a lot of really great things. And I, I have a quote I want to read. And this is when I was uh, all through the years you've served. This is something that I hear about you pretty often. And this was from Senator Pete Campos. And uh, the, the article talked about this was in the Albuquerque Journal. And it was talking about you really mentored him. And it, kind of that same thing as what Tim did for you. Mm. You kind of let him alone. But we, what he said, he said that you were that person that you worked very pragmatic, reasonable and fair across the aisle. And most importantly, with legislators from both houses and every governor that's come to New Mexico. And every time I talk to people, they've talked about the fact that you were willing to reach across the aisle and where we have such a division now. Did that just come natural or you just knew that's how we're gonna get things done because New Mexico is typically very heavily Democrat versus Republican. Yes. Well, the thing about it is, is I, I was fortunate to grew up with a father that was a, was a natural trader and uh, being his relationship with people 
and his ability to gain confidence in them, and they were that he was making him a good offer on their broom corn that was was sincere, and and uh, he said, you know, how you talk to people is, and how you think about it. He said, none of us are walk on water, and he said. That's what he always told me. Was he said, always try to be as friendly as you can to people. Because he said, you know, he said it's the most hurtful thing in the world sometimes when people don't treat you well. And you know, I learned up there a long time ago that neither side is always right. Right. And there's always emotions that are driven by sometimes ego, and unfortunately, ego can replace intellect very quickly in politics. And uh, and when you do that. Politicians are the done. worst in the world at, at being led around by the nose by being told how great they are. Because the thing you need to always remember, and there was a, a, a gentleman up there told me, he said, the minute you don't have a vote here, no one will know you. Well, I was actually going to ask you, I remember you telling me that and saying, you know, do people treat you differently now that you don't have that vote? You know they do. It's it's because it's a different world. It is. They're you not know. they're not lobbying you to to vote their I way. I can't I can't vote one way or another for anybody. But the thing about it is, the really truly people that were, are good lobbyists in government realize where your district is, where you came from, and there's they, there's things that you can help them with. But the thing about it is, is you always have to remember you represent the people that vote on you. And they don't all think like you do yourself. They don't yourself. always think I do, no. and they don't always sometimes know sometimes what certain certain pieces sure. of legislation can do. But, you know, if you just talk to people and try to explain to them what, what was in the bill or what was in the legislation, generally speaking, people will say, well, you know, I hadn't really realized that what that what that could do. So just an open mind and actually look at, at their and position. And as I say, there's you know, if you look at the legislature itself, the legislators from Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Farmington, and Las Cruces, there's a quorum in both houses right. of the legislature because it's all based on population. Right. And uh, Senate districts used to be when it first came, there was one senator per county, and uh, I still, you know, in the United States Senate, there's two per state. Right. Which I, I, I really think that gives everybody some equality that you At don't have. the population of some states versus Oh, California. California's got zillions of representatives. Right. New York does, places like that. You know, we have three. Right. And uh, Well, Stuart, our time is going crazy. I want you to tell me, what is the piece of legislation that, that you helped pass that that really is something you're really proud of? Oh, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, uh, I found out a long time ago that legislation is something over 40 years. I, there's certain issues that I know I voted on that were great things to do at the time, and hopefully they've worked out. I don't necessarily have a piece of legislation that I was the sponsor of that was anything absolutely, you know, great at all. All I hoped was is I, I always thought this state the proposal of right to work would be really good for the for a recruiting business to this to this state. It never passed when when we could pass it, we never had a governor that could sign it right. or would sign it. Right. And uh, you know, in many, many years we had governors up there that never would sign it. So it's uh, you know, those are things I wish we could have passed, but you know, the state this state is in such a unique circumstance that, that, that we have millions of dollars that are coming in here mm -hmm. from state-owned land that we're, the state is the royalty owner sure. of. This state is swimming in money, literally swimming in money. We have billions and billions more. My first session, the whole budget was $900 million, and I thought that was a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, and that's it a is. big bank account. But billions now, we're, we're, our budgets are in billions of, billions of dollars now. Your job would have been much easier today, possibly, than it was years ago. I don't know. It is, but the thing about it is, is it's, uh, there's always uh, people wanting more money than is available for anything. But the state of New Mexico is very fortunate in the fact that we had legislators that set up permanent funds that you we can get the income mm -hmm. off of but we can't touch the principles and it's well it's I know a lot very of good I know a lot of that planning and things for our finances came from you and 
I really appreciate you coming in, and more than that, Stuart, I appreciate all your years of work well, and, thank you. and your friendship as well. Well, so that's it's easy a, to it's do, a, it's and a Evelyn, pleasure. It's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, this station and folks like you that are here are what puts this on the map for oh. everybody. And well, and, and the funding and your support of it's huge. Well, so, Stuart, thank you. This was always you. something that we got, it was easy to fund. Well. Because the money was spent well, and we have came out with a product that has really trained great people in television. Well, thank you for that. And to all of you watching today, thank you, and we will see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>